<clears throat> well, somebody had asked me earlier um, if we could take just a couple minutes before we dive into the Word and ask that the Lord would prepare our hearts for that. So would you do that with me? Let's just take a minute or two, a pause, no music, uh, no one speaking. You just take some time and go before the Lord and ask Him to prepare your heart to receive His Word. Father, we know that there will be a day that we'll give an account for every word that we've spoken. And Father, we also know that on that day we'll be held accountable for every word that we've heard. Father, we ask today that you would allow us to be good soil. That as your word is preached, Father, would it bear fruit? Would you draw us close to you? Father, as Christ prayed, would you sanctify us by your truth? Your word is truth. Father, as we study it today, would you, would you use your Holy Spirit to mold our lives, to make us more Christ-like? Would you draw us closer to you? Father, we ask that you to allow us to know you in a deeper way today. Would you give us a deeper love for you? Would you allow us not only to grow in knowledge, but in affection? Would you find us to be faithful with our affections today as we study your word? It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 6, and we'll begin reading there in just a moment. Don and I love going to farmer's markets. Uh, there's one here in uh, Springfield. We would go down there quite often last year, actually, uh, to go and to purchase some of the fruits down there. Don, uh, you know, we, of all the things we would come out with every week, uh, Don had a whole list of things that she would get. Sweet potatoes would be on that list. I don't know if you like sweet potatoes or not, but I am against hypocrisy, and I think sweet potatoes are the biggest hypocrites out there because they are neither sweet nor are they potatoes. They're just horrible. So that's the best the jokes are going to get. So if you don't laugh at that one, I'm just going to have to save a laugh for some other time. Uh, Dawn always laughs at my jokes. Told the same joke last time. She laughed at it then too. Uh, so Dawn will get sweet potatoes and tomatoes and uh, cucumbers, peppers, watermelon, corn. And what I always leave from the farmer's market with is cinnamon rolls. So that kind of shows you where our health standards are a little bit different. Uh, thinking about farming, uh, how much farming has changed in the last 150 years? Do you think for thousands of years, farming looked relatively the same? I mean, with a little bit of an advancement in some of the tools, uh, maybe the iron got a little bit better, some of the tools got improved slightly, but really, in 1883, there was the first portable tractor. Of course, it was a steam engine, uh, and so you think that's less than 150 years ago, uh, but really, it caught on uh, between 1910 and 1920, and there's a couple reasons why tractors really caught on and farming changed uh, drastically during that time. They called it the agricultural revolution. Uh, and here's why. is because in the 19, uh, during that time was World War I. And so you had a majority of the world's uh, workforce that went to war. And so you still needed just as much food, but you didn't have as many laborers. And so suddenly the tractor, which was just, you know, for like large farms and big money, uh, it, the second thing was that they uh, made it gas powered, uh, which made it a lot more affordable, a lot lighter. And so people really began to invest in it. I remember the spot on my grandpa's farm where he told me he first saw a tractor. And so just sitting back in the farm, it was on the southwest corner, and we were sitting there one day, and he said, this is where I was when I saw the first tractor. He said they had bundled up hay. If you can imagine, this was my grandpa, bundled up hay, and they were using pitchforks to throw it up on a wagon. And so they had done that with a, a horse-drawn uh, machinery. And so watched a tractor come down the gravel road there, and he, he said that his father, my great-grandpa, Grandpa Harry, said, farming will never look the same. You think in the last 150 years, you, you, it'd be hard-pressed to find a farm that doesn't have a tractor with it, it's of, if it's of any substantial size at all. That being said, as much as farming has changed, 
it's still very much the same, isn't it? In fact, I can remember my grandpa, he was kind of an old timer. He was one of those guys that, you know, kept all the old uh, attachments, all the old tools. And so he would hook those up occasionally. He always trained a team of mules. And so occasionally he'd go down into the bottom land that they had and they would plow some of the land up. And I can remember as a kid spacing off corn. And I think for me, it was like two feet back to back and you'd place another seed, right? Did anybody else do that growing up? No. Oh man, we got to plow up some of this ground. You remember like, and it's, here's farming made simple, okay? If you put good seed in good soil, it's going to grow. It it was just that simple. And so thinking about what the plan of the apostles was, we kind of talked about this. uh, We've been using the last two weeks talking about this, these movements that multiply, talking about the major changes that have happened in the world, how there's some type of problem that causes this drawback. It's just like a wave. Then there's some type of priority of, you know, that's raised up. This is what we must do. Uh, It's kind of added a plan. And then there's the push as people buy in. Uh, So we kind of drew that out here. So uh, that's what our our movements that multiply was about this farming revolution, agricultural revolution that happened looked much like that wave. You had the, the workforce gone. We still need food. And so people said, hey, we've got we've to begin to do something that, that has uh, a way that we can produce more food. And so there was the agricultural revolution. Now, when we look at the apostles and what they did, they looked at the problem here in Acts chapter 6. Remember, it's the, uh, these widows who say, we're, we're not getting food. They say, we can't take this anymore. Something's got to change. This is the problem. Today, what we're talking about is what they've made as the priority. The apostles are going to say, we're going to need to set down some priorities because of this problem. It clarifies what our vision is. And their priority is as simple as farming. It's this, good seed, good soil, and God will bring the growth. So I want to show that to you from Acts chapter 6. So if you have your Bible, stand in the honor of reading God's word, and we'll dive in. Acts chapter 6. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up the preaching of the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. And they set them before the apostles, and they prayed, and they laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many priests became obedient to the faith. Father, we ask today that you'd bless the reading of your word. Father, we know it's a good seed. Father, we ask today that you'd make our hearts prepared for it, that it'd be good soil. And Father, we trust that you'd produce the fruits of the Spirit in us. Father, for those who are lost, we, we pray today that you'd produce faith and repentance to turn and look to Christ as the Savior. And Father, for your church, would you allow us again to see a multiplying movement? Father, we love you and we ask this for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, when we begin, we're talking about, as we walk through this wave illustration, we said this was the priorities whenever they kind of organize in their mind what is important. There's a million things we could be doing, but what is important? Now, when we look in the world today, there are a thousand different ways people answer that question. And the reason we answer that in such a diverse manner is because we've all been influenced, right? So you think even uh, as something as simple as what you would find attractive, uh, that, that might be you know, mainly molded because of what the world has told you was attractive, or maybe you had parents that kind of spoke that into you. Maybe if we could ask the question about what is success, we all might define that differently. And what do you see as success? In fact, there's whole uh, shows about this, right? And this HGTV, it's the husband and wife talking about what they want in a house. And what they're talking about is what priorities have they set in this home? I want a pool and I want this and all these different things they're thinking about. Ultimately in the world, we have such a diverse group of ways to answer this because there's a competition for your heart. 
This is why in Proverbs it says, above all else, guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of life. Because the world is wanting, remember we read this in, in Romans 12 about being transformed by the renewing of our mind or conformed to the image of the world. You're being pressed in. In fact, this is the amazing thing about Facebook. There are ads that are being sold on Facebook and you wonder why those ads are being sold. It's because you are the product. Ultimately, Facebook, they're, they're selling products and they're making a profit because they want to put something in front of your eyes that's going to influence you, right? They want to have you see this enough to say, oh, I do want to buy whatever that product is. And so what is your priority is going to be shaped by a, a whole slew of different things. Now, if we think about it theologically, we understand that it's very similar because every person in this room uh, has probably heard uh, sermons before, right? Like you, you have a whole host. There's kind of a smorgasbord of theology that comes into the room. You've had Pastor Kevin is here. So if you were here a couple years ago and he was your pastor, you probably heard great preaching and now you have me. And so you're like, eh, it's not as good, but right. So there might even be passages that we've both preached. In fact, I would say we might be hard-pressed for you to have uh, any type of verse that you read that you can't think of either a Sunday school teacher that you've heard teach on it, a Bible study you've done on it, or a sermon you've read, right, or, or heard. In fact, there's an app that I have on my phone called uh, sermon audio. I, I'd recommend it. They've got over a million sermons. In fact, I could go to any passage that I'm going to preach and pull up five to ten sermons, maybe more, on that one verse that somebody would say they preached. It. So online, you could go and hear all of that. So whenever we think about our theology and what we set as our priorities, we have to understand that we've been influenced by a lot of things. And what I want to tell you is that I don't think that's so for the apostles. Because the apostles, remember, they were all kind of the rejects. They were all men that whenever they were children, they had the basic learning of the Torah, but then they went on to their apprenticeship. They went back with their dad to go fishing, or they went on to this job. So when Jesus selected them, they had not been hearing teacher after teacher after teacher. They had one teacher, and it was Jesus. And so whenever you see what they said as their priorities, you have to realize that their priorities were based on Jesus' life and teaching. And so whenever they kind of set these priorities, here's this problem that collides into us, into, and we're going to set these priorities to push back against it to say, here's what the solution is. The way they're going to do that is based solely on the life and teaching of Jesus. And so here's what Jesus taught them. Mark chapter 4, if you want to turn there, the teaching of Jesus, it is as simple as the opening illustration, good seed hits good soil and it'll bring growth. And so what they're going to do is say, you know, yeah, we could, we could focus on all the fancy things that are out there, the many things that could be done, but ultimately, like good farmers, we're going to plant good seed, which is the word of God, and we hope that it falls on good soil, which is what they're praying for. So in Mark chapter 4, he says, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seeds, and he was scattering the seeds. Some fell on the path, and the birds came, and they ate it up. And some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they were withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil and it came up and it grew and it produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even a hundred times. You read on through Mark chapter 4 and the, the disciples, they're kind of slow to understand. And so this is one of the parables that Jesus says, if you miss the point of the parable, let me give this to you because you're going to want to use this later on. This is something that ought to stand out in your mind. Yeah, so I want you to remember this parable. So he begins to explain and says, here's what it is. The good seed is the word, right? Isn't that what it says in verse 14? The farmer sows the word. So when they set their priorities, here's what their priority is. It's this simple. This is good seed, now, when you interpret the uh, parables of Jesus, Jesus often does this. In fact, we do this like in science class, wouldn't we? We'd have the controllables and the variables. The controllable, like the, we want to make sure that this story is going to be the same every time. This thing is going to be exactly the same, and then this is the variable that changes in, in the equation, right? That's like basic science class. So in Jesus' parables, he'll do the same thing. Luke chapter 15, for example, he gives a story about a lost sheep. And then there's much, much rejoicing. And then he gives a parable about a lost coin, and there's much rejoicing. So you see, this is the controllable is something's lost. And then he tells the final parable, which is a parable about a lost son. And now here's this, this changeable thing, right? 
So the controllable, something's lost, but here's the changeable thing. There was no rejoicing. You, you understand? And so in reading, this is what happened. So I'd ask you, the parable that we just read, the parable of the sower, what's the variables? What things change? The seed never changes. You think every time it's good seed. Every time, no matter where that seed falls, if it's on the hard ground, if it's on the shallow ground, if, if it's in the ground and it's going to get choked out, every time the seed is the same. The seed is good. And so here's what they're saying. Here's what we want to devote our lives to is the ministry of the word. They believe that this word is going to be successful. In fact, we'd have this in other scriptures, wouldn't we? Uh, in Hebrews, we say the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing the soul and the spirit, the joint and the marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Here's what they're thinking in their mind. This is, you know, the, Hebrews is written by, uh, well, we don't know exactly who it's written by, but it's definitely an early follower of Jesus. This was deeply rooted in them that this was good seed. If you go back to Isaiah, it says that his word goes out from his mouth. It will not return void. It will accomplish what I desire to achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So let me ask you, if this is good seed, what does it grow? What is the purpose? He says, my, my word won't return void. So what is it? It will accomplish that which I've sent it for, right? So what is this going to produce? The word of God. What's the goal of this? Whenever the apostles say here, we're going to devote ourselves to the ministry of the word. That word there is the same that we get deacon from. They're saying we're going to deacon the word. What are deacons? They're servants. So they say we're going to serve the word. So if you are being served the word, what's it going to lead to? Anybody have an answer off the top of your head? Some interaction? If this is good seed, what does it grow? Brings people to the kingdom. Good. Anybody else? It makes disciples. Someone else? See here, we, we kind of have that mix, right, of things that we would say when I think about what the Word of God does. Ultimately, the ultimate goal of the Word of God, we could turn to Psalms 119, right? Here's a whole chapter about what the Word of God does, and what does it say? Psalm 119, I think it's 105, that says, Your Word is a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my path. Well, that didn't actually answer the question, did it? It just tells us now that we're on a path. So where does this path lead? We could turn to Psalms 43, verse 3, and what does it say? Lord, send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them lead me. Now oh, Now we know where the path is headed, to your holy hill, to the place where you dwell. You know what the point of the word of God is? The point of the word of God is to lead us to a knowledge of him, ultimately, through his son. So this is good seed, and what does good seed produce? A knowledge of him, that we could know him. In fact, this is what Jesus says about the Pharisees in John chapter 5, verse 39. I know we share this verse all the time, and I love it. It's, and he says, you seek the words, uh, you seek the scriptures because you think that in them you find eternal life. But it's they that testify of me, Jesus says, and yet you refuse to come to me. What is the point of scripture? It's to lead us to a knowledge of the Lord that only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. So if you have this good word, and here's the goal of the good word, is that it would produce a knowledge of him. Isn't this kind of what Paul says? Uh, Paul says in Philippians 3, I think it's verse 10, that he says, I want to know you and the power of your resurrection. This is the, the thought is that through the word of God, we could actually know him. And we could make him known. What, what's this good seed going to do? It's going to give us direction to know him. So the apostles, when they see a problem, they set their priority. It's very simple. You know what we need? We need to focus on good seed. Keep giving good seed. Now, that's not the end of the illustration, is it? It's not the end of the parable because there's a little bit of a problem in the parable, and the problem is where the seed falls. You see, all the seed was good in the parable, but the problem is that it often falls on the wrong ground. In fact, if you just read the parable and think about the law of probability, there's a better chance that the seed is going to fall on bad ground. So here's what their prayer is. Their prayer is that the seed would fall on good soil. Ultimately, their prayer is, Lord, would you first make me good soil? That, that when your word comes, that it would draw me to a knowledge of you. But there's a, a major problem. Let's read Mark 4 again. It, it, the 
uh, Jesus' explanation out in verse 14. The farmer sows the word, but some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes it away, uh, what was sown to them. Others, like the seed that was sown on the rocky places, they hear the word and they receive it with joy. But since they have no root, it only lasts for a short time, and when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like the seed that was sown among the thorns, they hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires of other things come in, and they choke the word out, making it unfruitful. Others, like the seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and it produces a crop. 30, 60, or even 100 times what is sown. You see, Jesus' teaching here in Mark uh, chapter 4 is going to be applied to their priorities in Acts chapter 6. You know what we need to do? We need to set a priority, and here's the simplicity of the priority, that we'd put good seed and that we would pray that it falls on good soil. So I want to ask you, when we're thinking about America and where we are in the world today, what is the problem Why is there no great movement like there was in Acts chapter 6? Is it because is there a shortage of God's word? I I think that in some ways we could say, yeah, there's there's some shortage. There's some, uh, you know, uh, churches out there that don't preach the truth. But uh, as a whole, there's a lot of great preaching in America. In fact, sometimes we talked last week about wanting to do our best, to bring our best. And there is this desire in my own heart to be like the best preacher in the world. That, just a moment of transparency there. And then I hear other preachers and I think, maybe I could be the second best preacher in the world. Because that guy was clearly at, on a different level, right? There's a lot of good preaching. In fact, you could get on the internet. I already told you about sermon audio. You can listen to over a million sermons. Uh, You go on the radio, I I have several people that tell me that they would listen to like uh, David Jeremiah and then they'd listen to one other preacher and then they come to church and go to Sunday school. Like there are people that listen to three or four sermons on Sunday morning before they ever hear me. And uh, that explains why they sleep, you know, so that's no problem, no fault at all, I'm not jealous, right? There's plenty of good preaching, but I think most of the good seed tends to fall on bad soil. Because the church as a whole has seemed to have removed the priority of prayer. Think about it. Charles Spurgeon used to give people a tour of the church. And his, you know, kind of his crown jewel was to take them to what he called the furnace room, the boiler room. And say, this is where people pray nonstop. And while he preaches, there were people praying. I remember when I was young in ministry, hearing a preacher that said that he watched the church go from the prayer meeting in the sanctuary to the fellowship hall. And it only moved because it was awkward how few people came. And then it went from the fellowship hall to a Sunday school class. And then it went from the Sunday school class to they finally just took a closet and wrote prayer closet on it. And and just a a handful of faithful people went. The early church, they had a very simple mindset. If you take good seed and put it in good soil, it'll bring growth. So they set this priority to say we have to be people of prayer. Because prayer seems to soften the soil. It seems to make it more receptive. There's, I don't understand how this works in God's sovereignty that somebody said there, there's not a rogue molecule out there. It was R.C. Sproul who you say there's not a rogue molecule. There's not a molecule that's doing its own thing. Everything is controlled completely by the Lord. And yet somehow prayer changes things. And I don't know how this really works together. There's something about appealing to the Lord. Jesus taught this about the persistent widow, didn't he? In Luke chapter 18, he says this widow kept coming to him. And if you look at the words there, it's verse 5 where he says, she was wearing the judge down. If you look at New American Standard, it's beat me down. She's saying this widow was beating me down. The problem is not that the seed is no longer good. It's still good seed. And it's that the church has lost its appetite for prayer. And not just the appetite for prayer, but the continuing. It was uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones that said, the problem is not that men do not pray, it's that they don't keep praying. There's no one who will wrestle with God. There's no one who grabs a hold and says, no, I won't let go. Remember Jacob? who said, I won't let go until you bless me. Now, I remember we did a revival in Jeff City one time. I know I've told the story before, but there was a lady who came to the front a church, 
uh, that I was preaching at. And so we knelt down. It was me, Dawn, and this lady. We knelt down. My parents had taken the kids. And I, I guess the pastor didn't see me. And so he turned the lights off. And so we're on the front. You know, it's just a great picture of prayer in the American church. He turns the lights off. And so, of course, we're like, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, hey, we'll finish up. And we kind of left. You know what we should have done? We should have said, lock up. We're not letting go. We have something to pray about. Now, if I could be honest with you, we'll have an invitation and we'll have dynamic music. And we couldn't get people to come to the front. And we have deacons that love you and they serve by locking up the church. What we need is some people who say, you don't worry about locking up. I'll lock up because I'm not done praying. Paul Washer said, you give, uh, he, he said in a prayer one time, God, you give what gifts you made to other men, but what I want is to know you and to know your power. Where are the men that will wrestle and say, I won't leave until God moves? It's not that we don't have good seed. Friends, we don't have good soil. We don't have people who wrestle, who are saying, I will make God weary with my prayers. And I know that almost sounds blasphemous, but that was Jesus' teaching, not mine. And you have to think when the apostles had all the things they could do in ministry, what they said is what we've got to make as a priority is prayer so that hearts would be good soil. And then we want to make it to priority to preach the word. Because if good seed hits good soil, it will produce a crop. I wonder if we're just far too easily pleased If God does a great movement here in our church and our, and our society, it's not that prayer might be a part of it. Prayer has to be a part of it. In our wickedness, every day we harden our hearts. Uh, every day we become desensitized to the pain in our world. Every day we've got a million things that are pressing hard against us. So we have to be a people that praise, Lord, soften our hearts. The disciples made this their priority. Good seed and good soil. God will bring the growth. In fact, look on down through Mark chapter 4, and it's the next parable, isn't it? Verse 26. And he also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, and night and day, whether he slept, sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts, and it grows. Though he does not know how, all by itself the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. Jesus, the next parable is to say, listen, you, you don't have to try to foster growth. If you put good seed in good soil, it will growth. Now, a good farmer is going to continue to check on the seed, right? He's going to go back because you see he does that. He went to the empty field and then he uh, sowed the field and then he goes to sleep and he comes back and he sees there's a sprout. He sees there's the grain or the, the, the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel, and then he comes back and he puts a sickle to it. So here's, he's, he's not being negligent. He scatters the seed, he prays, and he checks for growth. And then he, he gathers people in. This is the simplicity of ministry, right? You know, they didn't just get this from the teaching of Jesus. They got it from the life of Jesus. Flip back in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, Jesus is doing ministry, and uh, it's unbelievably successful, as you would imagine that it would be. All the people have come to him, and I think it's in verse 30, is it verse 33, that the whole town has gathered. Nick gave an announcement about Franklin Graham coming to do a uh, God Loves You tour. They're going down Route 66. They're going to stop in Springfield. If you want to be involved, there's, there's ways to do that. They need lots of volunteers. Um, but could you imagine, and that's on September 23rd, if you could imagine all of Springfield coming to that meeting, boy, we'd be patting each other on the back. We couldn't make it out of the stadium. My head would be too big. Franklin Graham's for sure. We'd be saying, boy, we did it. Here's Jesus. The whole town has come to him. And so they're, they're bringing the sick to him. They're bringing the lame to him. He's been doing miracles. He's been doing great work. And then it's bedtime. They wake up and Jesus is gone. So they, they're panicking, right? I think it's in verse 35. I'm, I'm not sure, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's in verse 35. He gets up while it's still dark. 
and leaves. And he goes to a solitary place and prays. It wasn't just the preaching that they saw from Jesus, his teaching. They've seen this applied. Jesus, in the midst of success, gets away to pray. Now, most people pray until they have success, and then they stop praying, right? They, they're hungry, so they have to have the Lord work, and then the Lord works, and they go get preoccupied with something else. But Jesus, in the midst of success, is still in prayer. Uh, they find him, and they, what do they say? You remember this, Mark 1? Say, everybody's looking for you. What are, what are you doing? Where, like, the, the whole town came back. They're all looking for you. And he says, let's go to other villages so that I can do what? Preach. Because that's why I've come. You, you see, the apostles, when they were setting the priority of the early church, they not only gathered that from the teaching of Jesus, but from the life, the application of Jesus. That Jesus was a man that often withdrew and prayed. You remember of the times they had seen this, because this kind of scenario happens again, where Jesus withdraws and prays, and they're kind of wondering where he's at. Uh, Last time they see that is in the garden. Jesus says, come away with me and pray. And we have them listening in to that prayer, because you have the high priestly prayer in John 17. And what is it that he prays? Lord, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. You know what he's saying? The whole summary of the message he gives right there in a verse. Sanctify them by the truth. Would you make their hearts moldable and soft? Would you allow the word to be planted in it and would it change them? I want to I ask you. Um, I, I shared in the first service. Uh, it's an exercise of frustration. Last week we talked about wanting to bring our best to the Lord. So every week... Just a little inside information about me. Every week, I think it's going to be the best sermon that I've ever preached. Just to let you know, if you're excited for Sunday, I promise I am so much more excited. I'm like, this is the one. Man, we're going to preach this. There are going to be people weeping. There'll be that snotty, ugly type of crying. It's going to be awesome. That way, it's not just me, right? Like, this is going to be, and it doesn't have to be emotional, but I, every week, I kind of have that thought, and, uh, which is hard because you only get uh, one best sermon, you know? So if I get to preach for 40 years, there's only one that gets to be the best. I really thought it'd be today, right? Um, And that's not like, I'm not looking for some type of round of applause. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. But I do, honestly, whether it was presented well or not, I truly believe that this is good seed. And even if I don't present it well, This is good seed, and this changes lives. But yet when I see a lack of fruit, and I'm not talking about in you. I'm talking about me. I I read Scripture quite often. When I see lack of fruit in my life, I'm only left with one, like, way to deal with that. It must be bad soil. There must be some reason why my heart is hard. There must be something that's choking out the Word of God in my life. There must be something that has snatched away the Word from me. Because I should be producing more fruit. Which again leads me back to prayer. Lord, would you soften my heart? And would you soften the heart of the church? That as your Word is preached... Would you change us? Not because the preaching was powerful, but because the word is powerful. And through prayer, God has softened our hearts. I want to ask you today if, you've, if your heart has been softened by the word of God, um, that you'd respond. You guys remember uh, in elementary when, when your teacher gave you the seed in the styrofoam cup? I think everybody got to do that. I hope you got to do that experiment, right? put that seed in the styrofoam cup, set it next to the uh, window, something would sprout. And you think it's because that seed was pushed into the ground that there was a point where the seed said, I don't want to be a seed anymore. I want to be a plant. And that seed died. And then that seed reached up for the light, right? I don't remember if your teacher talked about how that plant will lean towards the source of light. You see, this is the picture for any person that's saved. They get to a point to say, I... I 
I can't be this anymore. We we'll call that in Scripture repentance. Where we turn and say, I, I need to be made new. And in faith, we would reach to the light. We would reach to Christ. And He'd make us new. And He would produce in us His character. If you're here and you've never done that before, you've never died to yourself, I, I ask that you do that today. If you're here and you're a child of God and you'd look at your life and say, I, I'm in God's Word, but I'm not being change the way I should be. Maybe your prayer today would be this, God, would you soften my heart? Would you make me good soil? You respond as God leads you. Father, we love you. We ask that you would speak to our hearts. For those who are lost, Father, would you, would you draw them to salvation, that they would repent and turn to you? Father, would they in faith reach to you? And Father, would you save them? And Father, would you create in them the fruits of the Spirit? Father, we ask uh, here in our church, would you stir our hearts to prayer? Would you make us a people of prayer? And Father, I ask that for my own life. Would you teach me how to pray? Would you teach me how to be a man that cries out? that wrestles with you and does not give up. Father, would you put a fire back in my soul to wrestle with you, to go to you in prayer. Father, would you begin that movement in me and in our church. We love you, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Uh, we've got a baptism this morning, but before we do, I want to share one last thing. I had this in my notes, was going to share, but I think it fits better after the invitation. Last night we were uh, eating, getting ready to eat dinner, and so we prayed, and Titus has this thing where he puts his hand out. He wants us all to put our hands in like we're a team, and you know, one, two, three, and you all yell something. And so Titus doesn't say three very well. You understand one, two, it's like one, two, then, and then you yell it, right? So we all put our hands in, you know, the whole Proctor family there, and uh, we didn't know what we were going to yell, so we do one, two, three, and everybody yelled something different. So, you know, Titus just yells. Uh, Don, I think, yelled family, and uh, I think Alea yelled team, if I remember correctly. I, I don't know, but I know Levi, being the smart aleck, he yelled something, you know, just that's typical teenage boy. Anybody want to guess what I yelled? win you got to yell win i mean that's like the goal right so we yelled win i think a good way to describe this wave you have the problem the pullback and what the apostles do is they say we're going to tell you what we're going to yell we're going to yell preach and pray now the the vision that we've kind of laid out for the church is that we're going to be faithful in every field and so here's going to be our mantra all right here's what we're going to yell and i want to ask you know who wants to help keep me to this this is how I'd like to start ending our services. So we're going to practice it. We're going to do a baptism. And we're going to do it, okay? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to say, and we've got it here, uh, church, we're going to be faithful in every field, and we're going to yell, good seed, good soil. God will bring the growth. And whenever I say God will bring growth, I'm not saying we get to 10,000. My, my great prayer is that God would change me, that this would be fertile soil, right? And I hope it would be here for each of us as well and to the world. So this is what it is. Church, we're going to be faithful in every field. Good seed, good soil. God will bring growth. Sound good? You got it? So that's how we're going to start ending our services.